Okay, welcome back. I tried an experiment to put the projector over here thinking it might let me leave the shades open, but still no. The room wins. <clears throat> okay, so uh, over the last two lectures we started talking about walking robots. Um, you know, we, we talked first about the simple models. We did the rimless wheel as the simplest model of walking, compass gate being a little bit more actually like a walking robot. Uh, and then we used the slip model, spring-loaded inverted pendulum model for running, right? Um, and we developed a couple ideas in terms of um, analysis uh, for these. One was the idea of understanding stability in terms of a periodic solution that was stable, a limit cycle, instead of a fixed point or a trajectory. And the other thing we had to start dealing with was the hybrid dynamics of contact. Meaning that there's both continuous dynamics and some discrete event of, of when you hit the ground, for instance. <clears throat> um, Okay, so we did, we ch I chose those models to start because we could get fairly far with our, um, uh, with our analytical, uh, you know, board work, basically. Uh, on the rimless wheel, we could actually solve in closed form for the limit cycle. And uh, <clears throat> that's pretty annoying. Huh? It's flickering. Uh, let's see if it keeps going. Uh, um, for the rimless wheel, we could actually solve in closed form for the limit cycle, including the Poincaré map. When we actually solved the entire Poincaré map, we understood its fixed points, which were the stable limit cycles of the, of the whole system. We understood its regions of attraction, everything. Right? We got everything we, we could possibly get out of the rimless wheel. Um, for the slip model, we got most of that, but we, it required uh, an approximation, a small angle approximation in order to get the, rim, the return map. Once we had that, we could, we could do some analysis and draw some pictures. The compass gate, I didn't draw its return map. In fact, I can't get its solution in closed form. We've only ever been able to understand the compass gate with numerical tools. So, um, and of course, Compass gate's still pretty simple, but everything beyond that, we have, to, we have to understand how to use the same sorts of ideas, but through the lens of computational tools. Okay, so um, <clears throat> there's the natural set of tools that we've been developing over the course. We understood how to just even find fixed points and local stability, define local stability. We talked about local stabilization. This is for smooth systems, right? Local, local stabilization, e.g. with LQR. We talked about Lyapunov methods. And we talked about trajectory optimization. We did also do dynamic programming in here, but dynamic programming doesn't map as nicely into these systems. Um, but all of these ideas have an analog that we can push to the legged robot case. Or in general, any robot that's making and breaking contact with the world, 
although I chose to say legged robots here instead of you know arbitrary robots because uh, some of the problems that you get, for instance, with manipulation are different, are, are complicated in ways that would challenge some of the approaches we'll do today. So we'll, we'll understand those later. But, you know, over today and, and the next lecture, I'd like to make sure we can apply these same tools to systems that make and break contact. And for fun, I'll do trajectory optimization first and go, go the other way this time, okay? Just to mix it up. So, um, Although maybe I have to at least start with how do I find a fixed point. So let me do this and then we'll go up, okay? So the first question is how do you find the analogy of finding a fixed point, right, for smooth systems, non-hybrid systems, no contact, if we had x dot equals f of x, then a fixed point, of course, is point f of x equal to zero. And in general, it's actually hard to find that. For If f is a big complicated function, it can be hard to find that. But we can certainly use optimization to find the zeros of a function. And uh, we didn't talk about that very much, but that's certainly a possibility, is that you could formulate a search, you know, find me an x subject to f of x star equals zero, and that's a perfectly good um, optimization to write, in. and that's one of the practical methods for finding fixed points. For, um, for periodic solutions, even before we add contact, now we have to say how do we find a periodic solution, okay? And it turns out the natural equivalent of finding a fixed point with optimization here, finding the periodic solution with, lim with optimization, is effectively a trajectory optimization. Or at least that's the, that's, yeah, that's the equivalent to this, right? Okay, so let's do a a simple example. Remember the Vanderpool oscillator? The governing equations were a polynomial equation, and we had this nice solution that would come out like this, right? This was the nominal limit cycle. So, how do we find that nominal limit cycle? Well, you can write an optimization problem saying, Find me some x trajectory now, and I'd like to have it satisfy that trajectory to satisfy the dynamic constraints. In this case, actually, the Vanderpool oscillator didn't have any input, so I can just write f of x. Now, we, we talked about a few ways to, to write that. For instance, the one I'm going to show you some code for is direct collocation. Which, has, which imposes this at the breakpoints and the collocation points, right? Um, so that's a good start, but we want to find not just any solution over time that satisfies the equations. We'd like to have the property that x at zero equals x at t final. Okay? So, I'd like to find some trajectory so that the beginning of the trajectory equals the end of the trajectory. Even still here, we're not quite, this is not quite an, enough to get us a, a solution that we're looking for. Um, for instance, this formulation has a trivial solution of x equals zero for all time, because there is a fixed point sitting there and we don't want that one. So, a little bit more trickery is involved. Let's say I'd like x0 to be, um, so the way I actually wrote it, I said like, I'm going to go ahead and force it to be 
on this line. Let me, let me look for an initial condition on this line. So I said that Q0 equals zero, and I said that um, Q dot zero is just greater than 0.1. So look for an initial condition somewhere on this interval, but not at the origin. Go ahead and look up there for some initial condition, such that if I simulate it for some amount of time, it comes back and ends at the same, at the start, okay? There's one other subtlety that's required, okay? Which is that uh, the, the simplest way that we've written down these parameterizations, like x being a cubic spline in the direct collocation, um, has the, the not points of the spline pre prescribed a priori, but here, I need to make the, the time points of the spline, this is the, or the, the knot points or break points in the, in the spline. I need to make that be a decision variable too. And the reason I need that is because it's, I don't know a priori what the duration is for one, one loop around the cycle. I don't know the closed form solution, so I need to let this thing stretch and shrink in time to, to, in order to be able to have a chance of satisfying that condition. Okay? But it's not that much um, different than what we've done before, and it's only a few lines of code. Uh, Okay, so I've got a van der Poel oscillator. I make my direct collocation problem. I, I let the time samples, the, the number of samples is fixed, but I say those, the time step between those samples can be a, is a decision variable that can be between point 0.1, point oh 0.01 and point 0.5. So it's allowed to stretch and shrink each segment of the spline. Because this is a common thing to do, uh, it makes it, we, we have these extra method that says add equal time interval constraints that just says don't bunch up the first 52 points here and then have enormous uh, steps everywhere else. Just, you know, you're allowed to stretch and shrink the entire duration, but the intervals have to be equal, equally spaced, okay? I say, like I said, I just said the initial condition has got to be greater than 0.1. I left it, I bounded it less than 10 um, also. That's because IP opt doesn't work very well. IP opt is a, is a you know, to make it work for every solver, I have to upper bound it too. Uh, the one particular solver, IP opt doesn't like unbounded problems. Um, and then I just say the final constraint equals the initial state, final state equals initial state. I gave it initial guess also to help IP opt. Just said, as an initial guess, why don't you just start optimizing by something that I just picked, some circular trajectory like this. Just to give it some initial place to search for. It converges a little faster. And then if we give this a go, It nicely solves for the, it's basically instantaneous. Most of that was just loading matplotlib uh, in the windows, but yeah, it'll find me the nominal limit cycle of the Van der Poel oscillator, okay? So this is a relatively simple trajectory optimization problem. Uh, in fact, so I've plotted both the, the solution I get from simulating carefully and the trajectory optimization approximation you, you see. So there's a little bit of clipping in the corner or whatever, but it's pretty darn good. Okay, so trajectory optimization can find us a limit cycle. In this particular example, there's really only one limit cycle for it to find. But in more complicated examples, you could imagine having to do, you know, I, I picked the limit cycle, there was the fixed point, and I picked to find the limit cycle instead of the fixed point by adding a constraint like this. And in general, I can add or remove objectives and constraints to, to, to choose the limit cycle that I like, right? If, there, if the system is capable of many limit cycles. Okay, so that's for the, 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 the non-hybrid case. 
So it's a smooth system, but a periodic solution. Trajectory optimization gives us the tool. What about for the hybrid case? Now I have impacts, right? So what, the other, another system we talked about was the rimless wheel. And we, we found in closed form the solution for the rimless wheel. Remember it has a phase portrait that looks like, like the pendulum, okay? The feet hit the ground at, well, I called it the variables I used before, sorry to not do the whole diagram again here, but there's some foot hitting the ground here and a foot hitting the ground here, and the uh, limit cycle for rolling forward was a periodic solution that went like this. And then after the impact and the re change of coordinates, it would just repeat forever like this. And it was a stable limit cycle. Okay? How are we going to find that limit cycle if we didn't happen to be able to solve that in closed form? Okay. They, that is almost just as easy. Remember, I had the the total my dynamics were just the dynamics of the pendulum and then I had my impact dynamics which said that whenever my foot hit the ground I knew that my impact just turned out to be a pretty simple function of the, the post-impact velocity was the pre-impact velocity minus some, you know, times something that's a little bit less than one. And that's exactly the drop in velocity that took me from here to here. Okay. And then, of course, well, yes, so that's, that's enough. I'm going to search for the cycle with optimization, which starts here on this line. So I'll have a um, find me x and t is going to be a, a variable two, subject to the dynamics above, right? And then I'll just add a few additional constraints. I'm going to say that theta at zero is at the takeoff position here. It's going to be somewhere on this line. And I'd say theta at t final is at the next time I collide with the ground, gamma plus alpha. And I'm going to say that theta at zero, theta dot at zero has got to be cosine two alpha theta dot at t final. Right, it's almost so easy, right, to, to see this, that of course I can find that cycle by just finding this trajectory with those boundary value constraints being exactly matching the, uh, the impact equation. Okay, and of course I can type that in with a few lines of code. almost identical. I just said that the initial state is slope minus the alpha the f and the um, final slope is slope plus the alpha. Okay. The initial state is final state times cosine 2 alpha. Give it a solve. And there it is. You know the the periodic solution to the rimless wheel running forward, okay? So this was a particularly easy case of where I happened to know that I put, I, first of all, I put my periodic uh, event right at the beginning and end of the trajectory. So I just added this constraint that I knew was the collision constraint, the collision update right here. 
at the end to stitch those two together. But this is a window into what we're going to do in the general case. Right? In general, um, our first approach to, tra to trajectory optimization through contact is to take whatever complicated trajectory that we, we need to, to write down and break it up into a handful of trajectories that are inside each contact mode, we'll call them, and then write explicitly the constraints which connect one mode to the other mode. And that just becomes a slightly more complicated trajectory optimization problem. And it can be surprisingly powerful, okay? So, like I said, both of these solutions um, were, were nice in the sense that I didn't have to add a bunch of, there, there was really only one solution that this was gonna find, and there's only one solution that other one was gonna find without much work. But actually, if you even go to the compass gate, then, um, especially if you have a compass gate, do you remember the, the version of the compass gate that could both walk and run? It had springs in its legs. Um, suddenly there, there's a whole bunch of possible solutions. That, that, that system exhibits many periodic solutions for the same set of parameters, and if you change the parameters a little bit, change the mass or the spring length or whatever, you can get uh, families of parameters that change. And uh, there was a nice paper about this. Computer optimization of a minimal biped discovers walking and running. This was actually, so I talked about Hartmut Geyer's version of this last time, but around the same time, Manoj Srinivasan um, did, did this very similar work with this very similar model of this walking and running gait. But what's really interesting is that you, as you change a handful of characteristic parameters, you go from, you can find very different gates. Okay, and in particular, as you move the characteristic, the, the non-dimensional speed, so basically, if I were to just take the same solution and start it in a, with a velocity so that its steady state walking speed is moving up, then the set of solutions that you can find with your optimization changes. It changes from walking to running. If you then further add an objective to say, I'd like to find the best gait, okay, so, it, there's a big, there's a question about how would you define the best gait, but in the, especially in the world of passive dynamic walking and, and nearly passive dynamic walking, uh, one of the definitions of best is the, uh, in minimizing the cost of transport, so you'd like to be the most efficient gait, then you can ask for different speeds, what are the most efficient gates of this very simple model? And what's really interesting is that this is what happens first, well, let me do, I'll do it in the other order here. So this is what happens basically. If you change the non-dimensional velocity and you plot the cost of transport for these different gates that you can find, then the, the cost of walking goes up and up and up. The cost of the running gate, the running gate starts to exist at some point and it, the cost of it goes down, down and down, okay? And at some point they cross. That makes sense, right? Um, but what's really interesting is if you take human data then and you ask humans to walk on a treadmill with their VO2 max being measured, by, then you can estimate their cost of transport. You can debate how accurate that number is, but um, you know, there's some surrogates for measuring metabolic effort. Um, I said VO2 max, but it's actually the, uh, it's the I think it's the carbon dioxide the that they measure. But um, Okay, so, so you take your, your walking speed, you increase the speed of the, of the um, treadmill, and you say, uh, you know, just, just keep walking, and, but you must walk, don't run, right? So, and it gets to be a kind of an uncomfortable walking speed. And then you say, okay, now you must run, and, and there's some speed where you're comfortable running, and they slow it down, and they slow it down, and it's kind of annoying to run at a slow speed. And in fact, you're at a, your metabolic rate um, you know, crosses like this. Okay, and what's really interesting is that if you then just say, I'm gonna just put the treadmill on whatever speed and you're free to choose walking or running, when do people choose to transition from walking to running? It's like dead on here, right when the metabolic efficiency of running seems to be better than walking, mostly. People have done actually really cool experiments more recently of trying to mess with your, meta your senses of, of, of your uh, 
your ability to sense your metabolic cost and see if you can like you know mess with their with their sensors and, and get them to walk faster or, or slower and move that curve it's really uh, interesting stuff but you know humans of course have have multiple gates they can choose from and they t seem to choose this was the implication from uh, 1976 and 78 that they seem to choose based on efficiency and it's, I think it's more complicated than that but it's nice that some of these very simple models actually show the same thing you can that you can um, that the walking gets more and more costly, the running gets less and less costly, and there's a natural place where you'd predict them to change. Okay. And that was all done almost exactly like this. Like the, the, the nature paper had a, had a you know, method section, it was like we formulated trajectory optimization, we wrote, and they wrote the equations that looked exactly like this. Okay, And they did good science with that. All right, so what is the more general form? As we get to more complicated systems, uh, we need the more general language to talk about this. I've already been struggling to not use, use it too much without introducing it all, but the picture I want you to have in your head for these hybrid systems, right? And be specific hybrid. Lots of people say um, hybrid systems in lots of different meanings. Um, I'm talking about autonomous hybrid systems. Autonomous hybrid systems. It's a funny name, but it's to distinguish it from systems where an, a, a user command changes modes, like uh, you, people talk about hybrid systems for driving, for instance, and when I change gears, that's a, that's a change in my dynamics, in my, in my plant, but that's one that the user causes. This is one, the dynamics are evolving, and the world causes it, so they autonomously change modes, okay? And the picture you should have for autonomous hybrid systems here is that I have some flow, just like in my, uh, I have some vector field that's describing my equations of motion here. And along some trajectory on that, I have, you know, it's defined by some differential equation. I'm going to call this differential equation F1, because that's, I'm going to call this the first mode. Okay. And in general, I'm actually going to write X1 here, because it, it could be that you have a different x even in different modes. Somewhere as you're evolving through your differential equation, there's a impact or some other event that happens. We, we use some function that equals zero at, the, at this function to, to describe that event, and typically v will be greater than zero here, v will be less than zero over here, okay? This is called the guard. It guards my event. Sometimes it's called a witness function. Because in, in numerical simulation, they do a lot of effort to try to hit that accurately, and you need a function that tells you when, when you've hit that, okay? And then upon that, Hitting that um, that event or that that location and state space, I get a dis potentially discrete change in my dynamics, and then I start evolving again with a new, potentially new differential equation. This could be, it need not be exactly the same representation of state. Okay, so this is mode two, and this jump here is a reset, so x plus 2 is some reset from x minus 1. And this is the reset map. Okay, so the, you know, the most obvious example of this is, let's say my robot's foot coming down to the ground, don't judge the artwork, um, 
I've got, let's say I've only got two points that I'm going to really think about on the feet, on the heel and the toe. So this system already, even a very, I mean, I'm only thinking about, you know, a sagittal plane version. I, of course, I, I might have hit with the inside of my foot or the outside of my foot. It's much more complicated than that. But in this simplest model, I still have the heel and the toe. Then a reasonable choice for this, I could say that mode one, for instance, is his foot's in the air. And then I have functions, which are, let's say, the height of the heel, the y location of the heel, should be a function of my, my configuration q. That's a good choice for a guard function here. When the height of the heel hits zero, assuming the ground's at zero, then I've got an event. Right? Similarly, I have the height of the toe as another guard function. When the height of the toe hits the ground, and then I've got an event. Okay, so maybe I'll call mode two the heel on the ground. Maybe mode three is heel and toe on the ground. And then I probably want mode four, two, to be the only toe on the ground. Okay. And I can I know how to write, given the rigid body mechanics, I actually I know how to write the dynamics in each of those. If I were to drop a pin joint here, that works. I'll show you some other ways to do that later in the in the lecture. Um, I could, but I could just snap it to the ground and assume friction is infinite, or I can model it with a frictional contact or a soft contact. Okay, but that, that impact event will transition me into mode two, potentially with a discontinuous change in my velocity because I, something jams into the ground there. And then I'm gonna have another impact event when the, when the toe hits the ground. And then if I push off, all that's just for one foot, if you've got a biped, you gotta do that for, you can, you know, label that for all the other cases too. If you're being lazy, you can just assume that you're never in double support, but if you're worried about all the possible combinatorial combinations, then you might have a lot of modes to write down. But you can do it, and people did it for a long time. Uh, and you can get pretty far with it. It's also, it might be one of the reasons we build robots with point feet, I, I don't know, I, that's, it shouldn't be that way, but, but it does make things easier when robots have point feet. Um, okay. I should also say that, that the impulsive event, you know, this, this change, this instantaneous change in velocity, there are standard equations to get that out of the manipulator equations. If, you have, if you've derived the manipulator equations for your robot from the um, Lagrangian, then Knowing that the, the manipulator equations and knowing your guard function, you can figure out what that impulsive force had to be to come, so you come to rest. So there's, and that's actually written up in the appendix, but, um, but that, that is, all of those steps are, are clear, okay? So if you now wanna write a trajectory optimization on this, it's almost the same as what we've done before, right? So let's start by saying, if you give me, if you can prescribe a mode sequence, or a mode schedule, then I can write something like, um, you know, x zero to xk, should satisfy um, x of n plus one equals f one of x n u n, and then I should say I can say x k plus one to x whatever. Let's just say there's two modes. can just write down the constraints using whichever dynamics I think are appropriate in each mode, given I already know what the schedule is. Right? And then I have to write the additional constraints to make sure that I'm, that I'm actually in that mode. 
So for instance, for all um, i less than, strictly less than k, I'd like that phi of q i is greater than zero. I didn't make contact until the moment k. And then I'd like to say that phi of q k, I can just say x, doesn't, it's often just q, but, but phi of xk equals zero. So I've made an event happen in the middle of my trajectory. Okay. And I can say that x of k plus one is my uh, update map x of k. And then whatever additional constraints you might need to add to, you could add your periodicity constraint if you'd like to xn to, to loop back around, but you'd need not, right? If you have costs or objectives, you can piece them together like this, okay? And for the more complicated robot, I might have many pieces. I might have to say, okay, I'm gonna prescribe a priori that the heel's gonna hit first, and then the toe is gonna hit, and then the heel's gonna come off the ground, and off I go. If you're willing to do that, then you can do pretty amazing things. So, um, I actually, I spent some time this morning, I was trying to think, what's the simplest example of this? And, and I was thinking, you know, something that shows sort of it being non-trivial uh, was, I'm thinking about, I was thinking about a bounce pass with a basketball, and how could I just code up a simple example with a bounce pass with a basketball? And that just took a few minutes, and so I thought, well, that's really not that impressive. So I spent a few minutes on YouTube, and I found this. Um, <laughs> so I thought, I'll see if I can code that up, okay? Um, and at some point I had to come to work, so I didn't, I didn't put the spin in, but I did all the rest of it. So, um, but, you know, another few minutes and we could have had spin too. Um, so here we go. Here's, let's see, where am I? All right, so here's a... Um, trivial set of equations where x double dot equals negative g. That's the, the, the equations of motion of my, uh, of my ball in the air, right? And I'm gonna add in extra constraints here that says, so this is just integrating the dynamics forward. And I said that if there's a contact at some time, then I have a update equation which is just a, the coefficient of restitution in the opposite direction. So I'm just gonna put in saying that if I hit the ground at time whatever, that uh, the velocity at the next time step is gonna be in the opposite direction times e. Okay, um, a few lines of, of code here. And let's run this. So the first step is if I tell it never to make contact, so I made a, I made a little schedule here, just said, which of the nodes are in contact, okay? And when they're all zeros, then if the, the task, I set an initial condition saying you're at one meter here and you wanna pass it to someone four meters away at one meter, and it's free to choose the initial velocity. So it just does a big, um, like, I don't know why it's 70 meters high, but uh, it's impressive, right? So, yeah, um, probably if I added some mass or something, that would be but good. Um, and then you can see, so Z is just going down as you'd expect due to gravity. Uh, it's all good. It's, I did allow it to stretch and shrink time. And this time it actually did bunch up some of the time at the beginning, but I had a maximum um, DT and a pretty small minimum DT and it found its way through. Okay, so then I said, oh, let's see if we can just add a one bounce, so somewhere Big N, I did 50 time steps, so somewhere if I just ask it to bounce in the middle, now depending on, it still has to get to the one meter pass point, so it's allowed to stretch the first interval or, or the second interval as necessary to make the physics work so that it lands there, but I can just say, I want you to bounce once in the middle, and there it goes, it finds a solution that does a bounce pass in the middle. It's still fairly dramatically high uh, bounce pass, but it's just getting the units right that I didn't do that. Um, okay, I could 
ask it to do two bounces, whatever. Two bounces. And this is just calling direct co-location, right? So it's pretty, it's a pretty powerful tool. Three bounces, ding, 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 and it finds the solution, right? And then I thought, okay, well, let's see what the YouTube guy did. Um, can I do that? And again, I said, oh, I don't have time to put the, spill, the, the spin in yet, but I could do that tonight or something. Um, I'll put a wall in, though, at, at one meter. And um, I, yeah, here we go. Oops, did I do the wrong one? Oh, here it is. Okay, so uh, yeah, he's standing one meter away, or you know, half a meter, about well, 0.1 meters from the wall. It turns out it chucks it down to the ground super fast, bounces up, hits the ground. It still goes 17 meters in the air here, and then I didn't, I didn't model the backboard, but boom, makes the shot just like that. Um, so I'll animate it or something and make it fun, more fun. But uh, you know, just a, with a little bit of uh, floor, wall, floor, hoop kind of coding, I can come up with pretty rich trajectories. But I think it's, it's a valuable example actually also to sort of see um, that it doesn't always work, right? So, so it actually works very quickly. It, it didn't take me long to find these solutions, but I'm sure I could break it pretty quickly too. So if I um, said the last bounce should be at you know, the 49th time step or something, uh, where did it go? Yeah. Okay, it doesn't like 49 at all, but... All right, it did that one, okay. Oh, no, no, see, it was infeasible. It, so it, yeah, so look, it, it gained energy t um, in the solution, right? It, cheat, it got the dynamics a little bit wrong. It did its best to find the solution, but it couldn't find a solution that was like bouncing right here and getting back up and satisfying all the dynamics, right? Maybe there's no solution to be found, or maybe it just was unable to find it this time, right? So you can, you can give it values for which it struggles, but you can also, with very little work, I was able to find solutions that for where it didn't struggle, okay? So full disclosure, it's a local method, and, um, you know, it does report out saying, oh, I, I tried, but around Time 13, I, I did not satisfy the dynamic constraints, and same with at time 25 and 26. And so, you know, that's somewhere in here, and then 25 and 26, those dynamic constraints are being violated. Okay? So that's kind of the interface. Actually, I've, I, I've seen people use this in, um, in character animation, right? So you can, you can sort of drag around some knot points of the character, have the dynamics fill in the, the, the gaps, and it's a, sort of an effective way to sketch a character out and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty good tool, but it can require human interaction. Uh, good. So <clears throat> that was a very simple example, of course, that's uh, uh, just two state variables. Um, <clears throat> and we did sort of the rimless wheel uh, pretty easily, but we did the rimless wheel and the, even the slip model when we talked about that. In both cases, um, my prescription was talking about the minimal coordinates. And as you get to uh, try to apply this to more and more complicated examples, uh, that your ability to come up with the minimal coordinates starts to break down. So I, I said something about that last time, but I felt like I should have said it a little, a little more carefully. So, um, so when we wrote the dynamics of the rimless wheel and when we're doing the trajectory optimization, we described the whole system by a single configuration variable theta. Okay, and then I had to derive the equations which said, you know, this is a pin joint, so I've got a system that I want to derive my equations for that has a pin joint here and it's a pendulum driven by gravity. Okay. Um, if you imagine doing that now for the robot with the foot, and I've got a whole complicated biped on top of me, then I could add a pin joint here, solve for the governing equations of my humanoid given the pin joint, 
when it comes down, now I have two pin joints, so it's over constrained. I have to somehow handle that case correctly, which can be harder and harder to, to solve the loop joints out. And as it gets more and more complicated, our ability to write down a minimal coordinates, you know, I should I should drop a degree of freedom when I apply, when I land and impose a constraint. In fact, I might I'll drop multiple if I assume it doesn't slip. Um, so I should be able to write this always in sort of the minimal coordinates, but it just doesn't work out, especially as the number of, as the combinatorics of possible modes increase, uh, we need something better. So this was my minimal coordinates. The alternative is to use constraints, since we have constrained optimization, I'm going to let the rimless wheel fall through the air, okay? So now I'll say Q is X, Y, or Z theta. It's got three degrees of freedom, okay? It's well defined. Uh, whether it's touching the, the ramp or not. And then I have some equation here that's, let's say, the location of foot i, which is a, fu a function of q. And I have a constraint that the foot qi is greater than or equal to, let's say, the ramp here. Okay? Of course, I can hand this sort of constraint to my nonlinear optimization, that's great. But how do I get the x dot equals f of x u um, if I don't solve out this minimal coordinates? It turns out it's actually fairly natural to do that if you just look at the way that we would typically have written down the constrained Lagrangian. You can write that out and let the optimization solve your Lagrangian for you. Okay, so the the approach, basically, is to add a decision variable here. Let's call it the force. In general, it's um, there's force one for foot one. I'm going to add forces at all the feet. Normally I have eight, but I was... Lazy, I guess. Okay. Uh, and the equations of motion of this thing are now governed by, of course, my standard manipulator equations. Plus the, imp the result of applying those particular forces, which come in as an extra term here. Each one of those forces has some mapping back to the original joint space, which, which is, takes the form of a Jacobian. Okay, but the, the canonical form of those of that free body diagram is, is of this form. Okay? And these are the contact forces. You can call this a contact Jacobian. In fact, that contact Jacobian is actually just partial phi of Q, partial Q. <clears throat> so it's defined the, the gap function or the, the guard function that we, we use actually defines my Jacobian, okay? Furthermore, the thing that defines F, if I'm in contact, so, so I, can, I can write the rules for solving for F. So if phi of Q is greater than, equal to, greater than zero, then F equals zero. Let me see. If phi of q equals zero, 
that I'm in contact, that force is not equal to zero anymore, but I can solve for what the force must be by figuring, by also understanding that phi dot must equal zero and phi double dot Q equals zero. And if you, if you open this up, then you get a, uh, the accelerations that come through here are these accelerations here. If they depend on the force. And you can solve for the force that imposes that constraint. Okay? So one way to simulate even, if I just want to simulate the equations, is I could write the equations down in this form. Whenever I know that I'm in contact, I can dig into these equations, solve for F, stick it back in here and run my simulation. As an optimization tool, you don't act, you know you don't actually even have to do all of those steps in optimization. I can just say, let's make f a decision variable. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and let the solver do a little bit of that work for me. It means a little bit less algebra and a little bit less typing. But if I try to find some trajectories x, u, and my forces f subject to these equations, x dot equals f of x, u, f, and phi of q equal to zero, which implies phi double dot q equals to zero, then in order to satisfy those equations, the solver will actually have to set f equal to the solution, the, the derivation that you would have done in your Lagrangian. Okay. So that, that's the only way to scale these things up. You don't want to have to sit there and solve the Lagrangian in closed form for every combinatorial version of your, of your robot. Did I say that well enough? Okay, but if you're willing to do that, and you, you do the little bit of gymnastics to, to get this right, and you have to you know, take gradients of your, of your contact equations and things like that, which, by the way, this is like a pain. Um, yeah, so, so you get into the, you know, you, so most collision detection engines, if you're writing a, a simulator or whatever, all you have to do is figure out if I'm in collision or not. Um, but now I suddenly have to figure out what's the, the normals that are coming off my you know, collision in order to get a good gradient, and I need to get the derivative of the normals, and most computational geometry packages actually don't do that for you, so there's a lot of work in getting that right. Um, and it's very hard to get it right for arbitrary geometries, but that's, the, that's why you do a little bit of it. That's why we have to do extra work to do our uh, you know, simulation for robotics. Okay, so... Um, Given all that, we actually come up with a pretty general tool. So, um, you know, this is it applied to Atlas to find a solution that's torque feasible for Atlas to run. This is also when Pat was trying to play with shadows in uh, it's sort of excessive rendering here, but uh, um, it was the thing to do that day. Uh, we never actually got Atlas to run like this. Uh, we were too afraid to try, honestly, but it's torque feasible. This is like within the torque limits of the robot. Uh, it should, should happen. I mean, it was actually also impractical because it was on a boom all the time for us and stuff like that. Um, but with, with enough, um, so it, it still takes some amount of, I had to, to, to list a mode schedule. Actually, this version didn't, we have a, a newer version that doesn't require the mode schedule, but if you did have a mode schedule and you said exactly when the heel or toe comes off, if you give it an initial guess that the center of mass is going to go ding, 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 whatever, um, then you can find these solutions pretty nicely. But we didn't trust it enough to, to do it, you know, while the robot was running 
in, in, in reality. Like at the competition, the chance of us like running along, you know, we're thinking about what's happening, and then all of a sudden we're midair, and then the, and Snop says, yeah, you know, I couldn't find one that time, then um, that wasn't good enough. So, uh, so I think trajectory optimization is perfect for artists. It's great for setting up trajectories. Um, I, I'm a little afraid of putting it in a safety critical application, but people do. Uh, <clears throat> We had another robot that was, it's called Little Dog. Um, and it's kind of cool to see that uh, all of these different gates of the quadruped, I mean, I showed you the way that Mark Rabert did it by just um, writing out some simple intuitive controllers, but I'd say equally as intuitive if you have a optimization library behind you is you just say which feet are on the ground at what times and let the solver fill in the details. And you can come up with all the different gates of a of a quadruped. If you had imperfect knowledge of the surface on which you're running, would that mess everything up? So again, um, right, so, so I don't have the, like Hartmut's insight about that leg sweeping idea uh, was brilliant and I don't know have a good way to code that kind of insight into this, but there's a notion of robust trajectory optimization. For instance, if you try to find the same uh, one trajectory which satisfies or optimizes some objective, you know, and I try to, uh, sorry, one input trajectory, U, and maybe many X trajectories, but I'm going I'm to simulate four different instances of Little Dog all at the same time with height at slightly different places, and I want to find one trajectory that works well for all four of those, that's like the simplest idea of doing robust trajectory optimization, then you can start baking in some of those robustness queries. And then, does that make sense, the way I said it? Yeah. Um, and you can do more along that instead of having to pick a few, because as, as there's more and more things you want to be robust to, then sampling breaks down, and it gets very expensive very fast, so then we try to do some more algebraic type methods, like the sums of squares and the like. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the, the, in the little dog example, we basically just went through and had to say, if you're running in the trot, then foot two is in stance during these times. If you're in walking trot, then foot one was in stance these times. If foot four was in stance, the rotary gallop, uh, the bound had a different, slightly different schedule of the feet. But the cool thing is the difference in the optimization for all of those different gates was, was just like these three lines. I just had to specify which feet were in contact, and then some question about how they were being mirrored uh, over, you know, are they uh, uh, equal, sorry, is the, is the, is the symmetry in the, in the forward plane or in the sagittal plane, basically. Okay, so it's a pretty powerful uh, set of tools. Questions? That was a good question. Okay, so I, I've been setting it up, but the, you know, the major problem with this is that it's a pain to set up the mode sequence, right? So having to specify a priori what order the contacts are going to happen, I mean, you could call that uh, you know, giving some power to the artist or something, but uh, if, I, if I'm now, this is why I said legged robots, for instance, if I want to talk about uh, manipulation and I've got a dexterous hand and I'm going to pick up a piece of chalk, or, or something bigger than a shock, right? Um, do I really want to choose which pieces of my finger touch the chalk at which, in which order, and like somehow have something that specific? I think that's just dead in the water. That just doesn't work. Um, for us, actually, the challenge. The fr so you know. In walking robots, this has become a commodity tool, and people people use this a lot. This sort of you specify a mode sequence, you optimize it. It's a good way to get gates for complicated robots. Um, the first robot that really we just said I can't I can't take that approach um, was was when we were working on this fast runner robot. Um, let me go in this order here. So you remember the hexapod that ran really fast? That was part of a project. It was called the fast runner project. Um, the first version of that was actually much, much different. Uh, it started with this idea. Johnny Godowski, the guy who was was the great narrator at the beginning, he says, "On May 14th, whatever." Yeah, that was Johnny. Johnny's this inventor 
brilliant guy. Um, he started the whole project up with this hand-designed leg that he just knew intuitively was physically a good leg. And he was modeled after an ostrich leg. And look at how beautiful this leg is. Okay, and this, the amazing thing about this leg is that there's no motors on that. There's, that's Johnny's hand up at the top, swinging around, and the rest of this is just taken care of with springs and clutches and rubber, actually rubber bands and surgical hose and whatever. Uh, it was impressive and scary uh, design. But he did some initial prototypes, talking about the natural frequency of the ostrich leg and, and all these things, and convinced us and the funding agencies that you could build a robot that would run 50 miles an hour with this technology. Okay, um, so they went ahead and, and started designing it. And uh, this is the simulation of the fast runner ostrich robot running roughly 50 miles an hour. I think this was 30 miles an hour, the first version. Okay, now consider, so, so they worked, their, their part of the project was to build the robot, which was by far the hardest part. Um, but, and they used Johnny's intuition to talk about how that could not only be a, a periodic solution, but a stable periodic solution. That this simple, if you just drive it with a simple wave at the hip, and there's no actuation in the leg, they would actually run stably. And the fact that they found that, at least in simulation, unbelievable, unbelievably cool. Um, but we also had to answer the question, okay, what if you don't want to just run at a single speed? What if you want to change your speed or if you have to step over a rock or anything like this? Like it's not that much good if it can run 50 miles an hour, but it's going to smash into the first thing that's uh, the first obstacle. Um, so we said, okay, let's try to take our, our optimization toolbox and see if we can adjust this. Now, in terms of under actuation, this is this has got it in spades. There's one actuator at the top of the hip and there's a ridiculous number of links in the leg. And in terms of hybrid modes, of course, there's the foot touching the ground. That's the one we've talked about so far. But every little spring and clutch that's going tick, 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 tick throughout that cycle is also a collision, a hybrid guard, or whatever. And it was impossible for us to predict what the mode sequence was going to be. Absolutely impossible. So we had to, to step back and think, how could we write these sort of optimization problems uh, without the mode sequence? This, by the way, is how the robot... Are you the music? It didn't ever really run 50 miles an hour, but it looks awesome. I mean, they, they got it running on the treadmill and stuff. Um, and this was our MATLAB plot of the same thing, but um, this was trying to answer some of the fundamental questions of the uh, of, about whether that severely underactuated system could also do non-periodic solutions. Okay, so, oops. And the technique we showed was general. It could do some, some other sort of walking and grasping kind of ideas. Anything that was trying to do contact where we didn't actually know a priori the, the mode sequence, but the motivation was to understand uh, fast runner. And we were able to find the same periodic solutions of this complicated clutch everything mechanism. But we were also able to show that with the same actuation only at the hip, we could optimize solutions that would they did have enough authority effectively to step up, step down, to do some amount of foot placement on intermittent terrain. Right? And that was sort of the motivation for us. And <clears throat> we're close once we started writing the optimization problems in maximal coordinates, we were getting closer to a solution, but we have to do a little bit more work to to figure out how it goes, right? So in this setup that I've said, we still had to set, specify that sometimes the constraint was active and at other times the constraint wasn't active. But there's a, there's a couple different ways that we could write this force balance constraint so that the optimization is able to figure out whether that constraint is active or not, okay? One of them is to use soft contact.
right? If I use the floating base coordinates, that if I just have a model which says that my force at the ith contact is some soft contact model, like soft spring, let's say, which is a function of q, maybe in, it's a function of x. In general, the velocity matters too. Then I don't actually have to make an explicit decision about whether I'm in contact or not, I just have a complicated vector field, right? Where this, this is like, you know, we, we drew the vector field of the pendulum and we had these smooth vector fields. This is just saying that I have a, a vector field that when it's, you know, when it's in contact, it somehow changes, there's new forces, okay? But I can just have, if, if I have a smooth vector field here, I can still try to do contact optimization on that vector field. Okay. Um, right, so this could be equals negative k phi i of x, or you know, maybe, some, maybe there's some damping term. And that does work. I, well, sort of. So, people have made that work. I haven't made that work, but um, the people that made that work incredibly well are um, is Emo Todorov, Igor Mordak. Um, they had, you know, around the same time we were doing the fast runner work, they were producing this soft contact model that could design surprisingly complicated motions. of these full humanoids where the mode sequence was not scheduled a priori. So that's the trajectory optimization doing its work and just using these sort of soft models with some tricks. Okay. My favorite ones are near the end here. Kind of bizarre, but pretty impressive, right? Um, <laughs> so they played one really good, important, big trick, um, and it's to so. Yeah, I should probably stop that, otherwise no one's going to listen. <laughs> I don't know why they have robots climbing on robots, but <laughs> all right. Um, so, uh, you know, the fundamental problem with something like this, there's a couple problems, but um, the challenges are that the dynamics change in a stiff way. So, in my basketball example, for instance, if I'm throwing a pass from here to here, and it somehow, somehow suddenly becomes better to take the bounce pass, if the solver is considering solutions here, there's sort of nothing to tell it that there's another solution available here, right? There's Unless it tries going down into this part of the state space, there's absolutely no information that the solver has to work with to try to figure out that there's force available nearby. Okay? So, um, the way that they addressed that, if you think about the gap function here and the normal force here, then a simple spring law would look would look like this. The force has to be zero when I'm above the ground, and then after, below the ground I've got some linear function, let's say, of, of the penetration forcing me back. And they said, well, we can, at least during the early stages of optimization, why don't we just smooth that out, okay? And this, this is like a relaxation. which has force at a distance. And the idea is that you solve it, you know, with this, like, 
hand of God kind of force available that where you're allowed to, the ground can help you even before you touch the ground. And that's maybe enough to give you a signal for your solver. If it still chooses this, all is well, but if it needs force, it has a signal to go down and try to find the, the force. The idea is you solve it once like that, and then you solve it again with a tighter version of the relaxation, and you bring it down and bring it down until that relaxation is effectively zero. You know, when I've tried this, it doesn't actually work when you put it all the way down, but they have had incredible success with that. I think one of the challenges that I, I faced in this approach is that um, in order to be accurate, this has to be a typically a very high number. You know, especially because there's no explicit computation here of collisions. If you want to not penetrate the ground too much, then you have to have a pretty stiff spring. That means you have a pretty stiff differential equation meaning you need to take small time steps to simulate it accurately. It also means that for trajectory optimization, you need lots and lots of knot points. And it, it just doesn't perform, the solvers don't perform very well. My solvers didn't perform very well, okay? So, um, so that was a big challenge for, for, for me, uh, is these lar having these large values of K. Uh, <clears throat> yeah? Uh, so Given that the surfaces actually do have a stiffness, are the values of K used there often a lot less than the true stiffness? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, so again, so so the idea would, uh, uh, an idea would be choose a K softer than you really think is reality, and then it might be an easier optimization problem to solve, but you should stiffen it up to be the real, the real system. Um, the other problem with penetration models like this is because I often have more penetration than I'd expect in reality, collision engines don't do very well with it. So imagine I have a thin object. Fortunately, there's a paper plate here, right? And I'm somehow, I have a penetration model that lets me go through the plate a little bit. Suddenly I'm on the other side of the plate, it's telling me that the normal force is over here and it's gonna pop me out the other side, right? Or if I'm even on the corner of a, of a box, right? If I'm coming in, I'm allowing myself to deflect a little bit. It might be that all of a sudden the collision engine thinks I'm, I should do it on that side, I guess. Yeah. If I'm coming in, all of a sudden it says the closest exit point is over here, and I, and I get something that shoots me off to the side. So one of the reasons you see uh, simulators in robotics have dramatic explosions and the like is because it's actually very hard to get those right. Um, if you have a penetration model at all, then it's harder to do. So the, some of the better um, simulation engines in robotics use a different technique that's based on, it's trying to achieve no penetration, rigid contact. So when you see simulations like this, uh, large scale simulations, that's a, there's a different set of solvers that people use. They typically don't use these soft contact models. Instead they use rigid contact and something called time stepping linear, they typically solve a linear complementarity problem. Anybody here of LCP simulation? There's a, there's a different way to write this, which I can tell you quickly, um, that allows, that has been very successful in computer graphics. And that's the, all, the other way you can write these sort of contact implicit trajectory optimizations. So the idea is that you, you now do uh, an explicit time-stepping method, xn, un, with my contact forces, where f is designed using a backwards Euler update. If you don't know what that is, it's almost the same as my, my forward Euler but it's actually gonna use, it's a little bit strange, but it turns out to be the right thing to use in this case. This is the forward Euler. And the backwards Euler just, just uses the future velocity in this, in this spot. But it's almost a, a simple integration scheme, okay? And it writes it in terms of, of lambda, which is my contact forces. 
I wrote F earlier, but I almost always write lambda, so I'm sorry if I flip. <clears throat> but these are my contact forces. And then you actually write down the constraints for the solver, phi of Q greater than or equal to zero. You say that lambda n, at least the normal force, is greater than or equal to zero. And you write one other constraint, which is the complementarity constraint. Now the way to think about this, this is saying that either phi equals zero and lambda can be arbitrary or positive because of that, or lambda equals zero and then phi can be arbitrary. Right? So this is equivalent to writing phi q equals zero or lambda equals zero. Okay? It's a nasty constraint. It looks like this constraint. Right? It's a nasty constraint. You could still relax it with the same type of trick. Okay. But what's surprising is that it's a particular type of combinatorial problem where there are very good solutions, surprisingly effective solutions with As, as a linear complementarity problem, LCP. And in fact, when you see simulations like this, they're actually writing down an optimization problem and solving a small optimization problem to determine which contact forces are active at which time on every time step when they run these simulations. When these big game engines run these things, they're actually solving an optimization problem on every time step to do the simulation in order to figure out what the contact forces are. Okay. So similarly, you can write an optimization problem. I'm sorry I'm short on time to write it all out, but I, we have good notes on this. Um, <clears throat> you can write an optimization problem where you just add this constraint directly to the solver. You can give it explicitly the time-stepping dynamics, the complementarity constraints, or the relaxation of the complementarity constraints is just if I were to replace this with some small number, that's exactly what this curve is. You, you could do that just to help it find a solution and then converge. And this is now, uh, I think a, uh, typically you can take bigger time steps with this time stepping approach than with a stiff spring model. I think it's numerically better and uh, you know we can solve these, that's what we use to solve fast runner and other optimizations, including the, the humanoid running, <clears throat> okay? I said that quickly, but that's the core idea, is you just let the solver figure out which forces are active. It's a nasty constraint, I, f I fully admit. It's a local method. You have to do some tuning of your cost function of your initial guess in order to make it work, but it, can, it does have the ability to, if I had an initial guess which says you should land at time four, or the heel should land at, uh, you know, before the toe or something like this, it has the ability to change the code, the code, the contact mode sequence significantly to improve the answer. Yeah? So the, you know, long story short, by thinking about these sort of guards and resets, or by thinking about these sort of let the solver figure out which contact forces are active, trajectory optimization still works. It plays the same role of giving us locally good trajectories in high dimensional problems, even if there's contact. And if you want a limit cycle, then it's just a matter of tacking on a periodicity constraint. So that part of the tool still works. And we'll show you the analogous tools for stabilization and Lyapunov uh, next. Okay, see you next time. Final project description. Okay. And you mentioned that sometimes it's possible to parlay one of these projects a little more work into a publication. Sure. What are some tips or suggestions for getting that done? I mean, I think.